respect everyone's time, we will get started here. Um, good afternoon and good evening to everyone joining us today and welcome to the first webinar of IPO Education Foundation's new series, Behind the Idea. I would like to thank our webinar sponsors, Schwegman Lund Lundberg and Wassner for your support um, and making programs like this possible. My name is Kristen Luria and I am the program manager for IPO Education Foundation where our mission is to promote an understanding and respect for intellectual property and its value to society. IPOEF believes that innovation drives economic growth and that IP drives innovation. We believe that diverse teams innovate better together and that all communities should have access to innovation. We offer free curriculum for teachers as well as host programs to highlight innovation like our podcast, Stroke of Genius. I encourage you to visit our website, ipoef.org, to learn more about the activities that might be of interest to you. We are really excited to launch this new webinar series behind the idea. Our goal is with our goal with this program is to promote innovation and creation by, within, and for underrepresented communities. I've listed some of the upcoming webinars here. If you forgot to check the box during registration that you want to learn more about our programming, please feel free to email foundation at ipo.org and you will receive information as new topics are announced. Before we get started, I would like to thank our partner Athletes Without Borders for partnering with us on this first webinar to kick off 2021. I encourage everyone in the audience to ask questions today. To submit your questions, please, answer, answer, please enter them in the Q&A box and we will answer as many as we can. We have two speakers today. First, we will hear from Richard Watkins. He will share the basics of IP. He is the senior principal legal counsel at Medtronic who has been in IP law for 20 years. He earned a degree in chemistry from Morehouse College and a law degree from Georgetown University. Once we learn a little bit about the basics of IP, we will hear from Sean Springs, former NFL player and founder of WinPact, a Virginia-based technology and material science company focusing on impact protection in sports, military, and automotive industries. Thank you both for your time today. We really appreciate you being here. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Richard to get us started. All right, thank you so much, Kristen. It is really great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be with uh, such an esteemed and accomplished guest such as uh, Sean, and hopefully we can have a great time and a wonderful conversation later on. Uh, but first, I'm here to talk about intellectual property, the thing that I've been doing for about 20 years now. And I am going to share my screen. Go. Oops. You guys can let me know if uh, you guys can see that there. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, looks great. looks great. Awesome. Okay, what is IP? It is comprised of four basic parts, patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. Those are the main parts that we're gonna be talking about today and what uh, most IP systems around the world are patterned to protect. This is a very abbreviated history of IP, even though the US's version is unique to, to the United States. Uh, recognizing intellectual property and its importance has been around for quite a long time, as you can see there. Trademarks were used in ancient Egypt and China to show the origin of, of craft like pottery, gold coins, and seals. Some samples go back to 5000 BC, where pottery made for the emperor was marked by the creator of the pottery, along with the place of origin. Some of you may have heard or be familiar with very expensive uh, Chinese vases and whatnot. And actually that's where the term China comes from with respect to uh, these dining uh, materials. Even before that, there are ancient cave drawings that seem to show that early humans marked their cattle to show ownership. 
we know about branding cattle out in Montana and, and those places with, with beef cattle are, are raised to show where, what farm they came from. That is a sign of, uh, of ownership. It's a trademark, if you will. The concept of patents go back to probably 600 to 500 BC to ancient Greece, where a patent was recognized for making bread. Bread fraud apparently was a thing back then. You know, if you wanted, the emperor wanted his bread, he wanted his bread from a certain place and nowhere else. And the, these incentives continue to spread through Europe through to the 1700s. Uh, access to obtaining a patent at that time and early European patent systems were exclusionary such that only a few could obtain a patent. They made it very, very expensive, which is something that is not the case in the United States when we formed, uh, when, when our constitution was written. One example of how expensive it was, was in Britain, uh, a patent application fee was about 11 times, was more than 11 times per capita income of their average citizen. That is not the case here uh, in the United States now. The foundation of our IP protection system is in the constitution laid by our founders in 1787 in the very first article of the US Constitution. It outlined the precepts of our democratic society. In article one, section eight, clause eight of the constitution, Congress was given the authority to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So this is not something that was made by the courts or common law, it is embedded in our constitution. Now we're gonna go back to one of the four types of IP that I talked about, patents. And that's what we're gonna be talking about later on today with Sean, and it's pretty much the one that most people know about and takes up the most space in our IP ecosystem. A patent is an intellectual property right granted by the government or uh, of a nation to an inventor that gives him or her, them, the exclusive right to that invention for up to 20 years in exchange for disclosing all the details about that invention uh, to society. Um, that's the exchange. You describe your invention sufficient enough that someone can make it, someone skilled in the art can make and use your invention. And in exchange, the government gives you a 20 year exclusive right uh, 20 year right to exclude people from practicing your invention. Copyrights. A lot of us know about copyrights because of music, plays, television shows. A copyright is an intellectual property right granted by the government to an author of an original literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, or other eligible creative work. It gives the creator exclusive right for a limited time to control how the work is published, reproduced, performed, or displayed. So many of the popular artists, musicians that you, you guys know out there, Beyonce and Jay-Z or Dua Lipa or, um, you know, um, any, I, I, why can't I think of any other artists right now? But there are other artists out there. Um, they write music, they perform music, and they have copyrights to them. And they can have a license agreement to have, let people display, play, stream uh, their music, have that music played in a television show or at, at the Super Bowl or at a stadium. It gives them the right to do that. It is also for a limited time. Some of you uh, know that there are old songs that are out there, uh, whether it's old uh, spirituals uh, from the 1800s or old uh, literary works by Arthur Conan Doyle, for instance, Sherlock Holmes, um, that have been around for a very long time that are in what's called the public domain. The original author of Sherlock Holmes, for instance, is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He died a very long time ago, but every now and again, you'll see a book about Sherlock Holmes or a TV show about Sherlock Holmes. And that's because the source material is in the public domain. Trademarks. A lot of us have seen that, whether it's the Golden Arches of McDonald's or Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola can or the swerve there. 
Trademark is an IP right granted by government to an individual, business, or legal entity that creates and uses a distinctive word, name, symbol, phrase, uh, a device uh, to distinguish its products or services from those of any other ent entity in the marketplace. Another part of trademarks is, is called trade dress. Uh, you guys may know that there's a distinctiveness to how an Apple store looks. Uh, or how McDonald's looks. You can tell, even though the golden arches may not be there, you can tell the design of uh, McDonald's restaurant. Trade dress, it's called. Trade secrets. One that's not so much talked about, and rightfully so. Trade secret law is a source of protection for intellectual property that serves as an alternate alternative to pat patent law and trademark law. And it requires that the intellectual property be not be publicly disclosed. One common example is the formula for Coca-Cola. The formula for Coca-Cola is a trade secret. It is apparently locked in a vault somewhere in their headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if you were to go home and practice and experiment and create Coca-Cola, you were somehow to come up with the formula, then it's yours. You went through the hard work to figure it out. And that's the thing about trade secrets. If someone on their own finds it out somehow, then the trade secret can be lost. And that's why it's very, very important to people and companies that have trade secrets to keep it secret. These are some of the examples I talked about earlier, McDonald's and Coca-Cola. To the left, some people may not have seen what a patent actually looks like. I know I didn't until I was in law school, basically. Uh, we can talk about my story a bit later, um, but that is what a patent looks like. You can see here, this is a patent to a Jackson et al. And that Jackson is Michael Jackson, the performer. Uh, he has a patent uh, on a dance move where he is able to dance, well, he was able to dance and move his body forward ever so much like he was leaning and then come back up. This patent covered that, it's pretty neat. There are a couple of theories on the, on the value of intellectual property rights. There's the bargain theory and the natural rights theory. And the bargain theory, it's, and I talked about this before with respect to patents, in exchange for inventing something useful to society, it gives the inventor the exclusive right to that invention for a limited time. And after which it goes into the public domain and belongs to society. And people can do whatever they want to. They can build on your idea. They can build on your invention and create things that could may not have even been thought about by the original inventor. It helps spur uh, innovation. And the natural rights theory. And this flows from the inventor's inherent rights to property. Hey, I invented this thing. I invented this padding. It's mine. And in exchange for disclosing it to the public, um, the nature of my invention, the Constitution authorizes the government to enforce my right to exclude, to exclusive, to exclude anyone from practicing this invention. Hey, this is my idea. This is my padding that I, invent, I invented. Government, you're going to help me exclude people from unlawfully using my invention because it's my natural right to keep my thing. Now, the goals of our patent system, the US patent system, that is, is to stimulate invention. And I would say, with that innovation, uh, again, the inherent property rights of inventors and authors of their creations are protected, thereby helping to ensure that the wellspring of creation and productivity do not dry up for lack of incentive. We have to give people reasons to invent. One, uh, two, rather, sharing knowledge, promoting the progress and the general welfare by disclosing that invention. The benefits derived from these inventions are creations and creations are ultimately harnessed to the public good through disclosure, thus promoting progress of the nation and the general welfare of citizens, and of course, also the world. Here we go. All right. 
right, here we go. Now, what can be patented? Patent subject matter. There are laws and, and statutes that go to this. It, it's in the patent, la patent Act. The criteria for patenting is what exactly <clears throat> is, I'm sorry, is in Title 35, the U.S. Code, and it says that any machine of manufacture, process, or composition of matter can be patented if it demonstrates three characteristics. That's novelty, non-obviousness, and utility. Novelty is, is it original? Has it, has it ever been around before? Is it non-obviousness? Is it non-obvious? Which means if someone who's skilled in the art in this area uh, reads about your invention, would they say, huh, I never thought of that, or I wouldn't have gotten there but for reading your disclosure. And then utility, it actually has to have a use. It just can't be something that's there. It has to have a use, it has to be something useful. And we just talked about this, novelty, utility, and non-obviousness. These are more technical definitions of, uh, of these particular pieces. Two categories for patentable inventions. There are products, and processes. Product can be, of course, shoes. A process is logistics, how FedEx manages packages that they pick up in Washington, D.C., send to Memphis, and then it ends up in Denver. You, you cannot patent ideas. The most important reason why one thing is patentable and another is not lies in the difference between ideas and applications. You can't patent mathematical formulas a law of nature, like E equals MC squared, or a natural phenomenon, like lightning. They all exist independently of human intervention, and making this knowledge uh, freely available, therefore. There are examples of some products, a physical thing like the, the robot arm here on the left. In the middle, you have artificial knees, Articles of manufacture, and then compositions of matter, like this blue or an epoxy resin, it looks like here. Processes defined as a means to an end, a means of doing something new and a new way of doing, or a new way of doing something old. Similar to what I was saying before, business process like FedEx. FedEx's logistics uh, handling packages to and fro. Plant and design patents. We kind of talked about different uh, types of trademarks earlier. Uh, there are different types of patents as well. You can get a patent on plants, all right? Now, plant and design patents, there are requirements uh, for these. They're substantially the same as those for utility patents, which are kind of regular patents for the sake of this conversation. But instead of novelty, util novelty utility, and non-obviousness, the criteria for plant patents are novelty, distinctiveness, and non-obviousness. The, the plant has to be distinct from its forebears. And the criteria for design patents are novelty, ornamentality, and non-obviousness. One. Um, Good example lately for a design patent is that of the, the iPhone. There is a design patent on your iPhone. And you might think it's weird because it's just a rectangular box in essence, but there are certain distinctive novel and ornamental aspects of the phone that Apple was able to obtain protection on. Patentable inventions fall into one or two categories, products, products or processes, and, and we just talked about of those. Um, now, applying for a patent, and I'm going to go through this so we can move on to the next part of the program. What can you expect when you actually apply for a patent? To start, an application must, applicant, that's you, must first determine what type of patent to apply for. Is it going to be a utility, a design patent, or a plant patent? Then you must determine the, the filing status, large entity or small entity. Are you a corporation, for instance, which would be a lar large entity, uh, or a small entity, just yourself, or a really, really small company with just like five people? 
or the new category of a micro entity, which actually is like just yourself. Finally, the applicant must decide whether or not an abbreviated provisional patent application versus a complete non-provisional one. Uh, we won't get into the too much into the details of that, but you could file a provisional application that just to kind of save your spot in time and then follow up with a non-provisional or for the sake of this conversation, a, a, a real or prosecuted patent application. The most critical task of filing the non-provisional application is to draft the claims. The claims are the legally enforceable part of a patent. That those are the things that a court will use to determine whether or not someone is practicing your invention. Depending on how well the claims are drafted, you could win or lose your patent rights at any point in the examination process. And beyond that, after you've actually obtained the patent, it can be challenged. Once a patent application is submitted and all fees are paid, the patent examiner reviews the application to determine if the invention meets the requirements for patentability. That's what we call patent prosecution. If the patent is ready for issuance uh, upon the examiner examining and, and accepting all the remaining claims, the patent holder pays the, the fee, the, app, the applicable fee, and the USP TO issues the patent. And it looks nice and pretty. They give you a nice, what they call ribbon copy of your patent in nice uh, stationary type paper. Enforcing your patent rights. If later on you find someone practicing your invention, you can take them to court. And it's up to you, uh, the patentee, to enforce it against infringers by filing a civil case in federal court for patent infringement. Patent infringement occurs regardless of the infringer's lack of knowledge of the patent or their, in, or their intent to infringe it. In modern times, patent enforcement has become a long and very expensive process. So it's, it's a big, big thing. And lastly, uh, over the last 40 years, IP has grown from an arcane, narrowly specialized legal field into a major force in our society, uh, our social and economic life. Now, IP is the chief engine of wealth creation and economic growth in the world. And America's patent system helped create some of the, the most successful economy uh, on this planet, some would say, in the United States. So that is my presentation. And this has questions here, but we are actually going to move to our special guest. And Kristen, I'm going to stop sharing now. There we go. Thank you, Richard, so much. Um, I will now introduce Sean. We gave a brief introduction in the beginning. Um, he is going to tell us a little bit about his background um, and how his uh, company came to be. So Richard, please uh, go ahead and you can lead us with the first mm -hmm. question. All right, awesome. Sean, welcome. Hey, Richard, great you, presentation, sir. man. I can and, I, and I'm sorry I had to stop the video, but I had to get up. You inspired me to get up and uh, demonstrate some things that are represented in your pre uh, presentation. So that's awesome. All right. Awesome. And you are an example of, of what uh, these young people should strive for in recognizing that they have an idea. They can get an invention and start up a business, man. You know, that's um, what it's all about. All right. So let, let's start off with learning just a bit about you and your background. Um, Where'd you come from? Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go yeah. to high school? And yeah, they gave me to tell you my story a little bit. Um, um, thank you guys for having me on, and, and I love sharing my story. Uh, I grew up in a while. I was born in a place called Williamsburg, Virginia. Most people know about Colonial Williamsburg and Jamestown and um, Christopher Columbus, I like to tell people all the time. But I grew up mainly uh, going to school in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, over in Silver Spring, Maryland, where I went to high school at Springbrook High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think for me, all my life, I, I was a, an athlete, but I was first and foremost, I was always curious. I was a curious kid and wanted to see how things could be improved or made better. And, you know, I thought I was going to be an architect. Mm -hmm. And then, Richard, I was a, awarded a scholarship for football to the Ohio State University where I, where I played there. And, um, you know, coming out of high school, it was important to me that I got really, really good grades. And 
And I was fortunate enough to have the grades and athletic ability to go to Ohio State and play football there. And I played three or four years there, and I can tell you more about it. But you know, um, you know, I won't give too much into it myself. But <laughs> but right, then I from there I went to the NFL. Now you said in high school you thought you might be an architect. Yeah. Now, uh, you're you were interested in that. Did you had you heard about intellectual property or patents uh, in high school? In high school, I had no idea what a patent was or anything about trade secrets, trademarks, copyrights. I, I was just fascinated with the way things, you know, you could sketch or design things out, you know, in architecture and see them come to life. And I had a drafting table and, you know, that was like, you know, one of my favorite classes in high school. Uh, that's interesting. When would you say was the first time you heard of intellectual property or patents in. And, and while you think about that, I'm gonna I'll talk about my story. I didn't even know what intellectual property was until my junior year of college. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know what the patent was. It wasn't until I was talking with an upperclassman. I was a chemistry major mm -hmm. and I didn't wanna to go to medical school. And I talked to an upperclassman who I knew wasn't going to medical school. I said, man, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to intellectual property law. And I was like, what's that? Right. And so it took a nice conversation with me and here I am 20 some odd years later. Yeah. And I just have to say that one of the things that we want to do with IPO is expose people to this early on in their lives. So they wouldn't, they won't have to stumble upon it yep. like we did uh, yeah. later on. So when was the first time you heard about intellectual property and all that? I, I would say the first time I probably heard about patents around the same time was my junior year at Ohio State. And I was in uh, a business class and they were just talking about uh, McDonald's and all these other companies mm -hmm. and corporations that uh, had started. And part of it, they was talking about trademarks and the golden arches and Coca-Cola mm -hmm. as a trade secret. And um, so that was the first time that um, the idea of, and I think we learned about the corporations and all those other things. That was the first time that, you know, I was introduced to the idea of a patent that I heard of. And then, you know, um, after that, you know, uh, when I was drafted to Seattle, I was fortunate to be drafted by a guy named Paul Allen. Mr. Allen, yeah. most people know, even if you don't know who he is, you may know his product. He started Microsoft with Bill Gates. So if you guys got an Xbox, <laughs> you, you, you know. Um, you you knew that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that guy. So, because he, he uh, at the time I was coming out of school, he had just bought the Seattle Seahawks. So I was his first draft pick. And I had a chance to spend a lot of time with him and I would ask him questions about business, you know, and you know, he was just, he, he, he took time to educate me and talk to me about business and told me about Microsoft and trade secrets and, you know, uh, you know, and, you know, he was telling me about data and different things uh, 20, 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a mentor of mine and I, and I got to see other companies in Seattle. Like uh, I had a buddy working for a company selling books online. And I was like, I don't know if that's a good idea, but we know Amazon turned out to be a pretty good company. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so I, I became more interested in business and investments and stuff like that until I had a chance to start mine. You also hit on something that's very important as well, and that's mentorship. Yep. You know, it's really important to have someone who might be more experienced to you in, in, in the area you want to go into talk to you about these things, finding someone in, as an outlet to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, that, that, that's very important. We, we talk about it all the time in sports and having a, a coach or somebody who could teach you lessons or help you, guide you through uh, having success when you're playing sports, high school, college, and NFL. And the same thing, you know, what I see in the business world, you know, as a founder and, and, and CEO and leader, you know, you need, a, you need mentors that continue to help you uh, improve and get better. So at some point you're, you're going along with your life, you're, you're yep. playing in the, in, in the league and an idea comes to your head. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us about that. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. As I told you, I was always curious and interested in business. And um, 
you know, wanted to be an architect, but when I went to Ohio State, they tell you the class time, it was tough. So I ended up going into business and ultimately getting a degree in sociology. But um, that that itch of technology and being excited because I was living in Seattle at the time where all these mm-hmm. amazing yeah. companies were being founded. Um, I just, I, I saw this technology right when I was going to end because really, I was more thinking about when I played football, what was, when I was done football, what was I going to do next? I always mm-hmm. looked at, you know, football as a stepping stone, the opportunity. And I saw this technology in a baby car seat because I developed a relationship with a, with the president of Safety First who was, you know, over these car seats. And the, and, and the idea one day, like any concerned parent, I'm, I'm taking the car seat out the box and I'm reading the label and it says it disperses energy, absorbs energy and everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, man, this is some really, really cool technology and revolutionized um, the industry of side impacts for kids. And then that idea sparked in my mind. If you can protect a baby or a kid in a car seat, could this technology possibly be used for something else? And mm-hmm. that's, and, and as you, as you test on it, Darrell had the patent, so I had to go talk to those guys about potentially licensing their patent, which, you know, or, mm-hmm. you know, or working with those guys. But, you know, so. Can, can, can I stop you right there? Because yeah. a lot of people have ideas. Yep. Right. And they just have the idea. They, they don't really take it further. But at that moment, you realize you, you realize something and you took that step to go talk with an expert. Well, why do you think you took that step to talk to an expert as opposed to just saying, man, that would be a cool idea if someone, you know, did this, that, and the other? Well, that, that's an interesting question. And, 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 and one is because, you know, I had a relationship and it was like, uh, he was a friend and I just called him up like, who, how'd you guys think of this? I was just naturally a curious person of how they came up with this idea, this airbag with foam inside to absorb and disperse energy. And I wanted to know more. And the second thing, the why, like when you're thinking about ideas or technologies, usually because there's a a why, there's a need. Mm -hmm. And that why for me was, how do I make the next generation of athletes safer? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about my kids playing sports. I was thinking about all the injuries that I suffered in the NFL and my friends and, you know, 2010 and 11, everybody was talking about concussions and I wanted to give back and do my part. So when you're out there for all those listening, you know, you know, that inclusiveness, that outside thinking is what drives innovation. And, you know, so that's, that's a strong, yeah, it's a strong motivating factor, the safety of your kids and your right. friends. And then, you know, making it safer so that people won't go through the same injuries that you went through. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. So you talk to the experts and yeah. so at some point you had the idea to, to, to create something of your own. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and I've said, man, I went to talk to them and I, and they worked with my attorney. So I, I knew I had to get an attorneys because obviously they had the patent. Like you said, it's a law. You just can't right, <laughs> create right. something. You can't create something with somebody else patent, but they work with my, my legal team. And we realized, and we didn't talk about it, but your patent could be so specific around a car seat that I took like you said, the idea and says, well, I don't want to do a car seat and I want to infringe on your patent, but could I possibly use it for everything else? And they helped me with my uh, legal team uh, work through the nuances of getting a patent. And, and then I had an engineering team and my team and we were able to write up a patent and I was awarded a patent. And a this is patent. right. And this is WinPact. This is WinPact. This is WinPAC. At that point, when I knew I could receive a patent and receive something like this, this is my patent. I put it on a plaque. I wanted to show you. Uh, We got a a patent around this application called the Crash Cloud, which is a little pad like this that, you know, you guys can see it. It It's just a little pad. This one goes into the military helmet, but uh, it was a little pad that absorbed and dispersed energy. And that was our first original idea of like how can I take this technology that's used in a baby car seat Mm -hmm. and put it in other applications uh and protect myself because I I really believe it's a great technology I know it's doing wonders in the car seat industry so I worked with my attorneys and 
and we looked at it and I was able to uh, get awarded a patent in 2014. It's a utility patent. Mm -hmm. And then Richard, I started to learn more about the patent process from designed patents to all those other things that you learn and you try to, uh, the, the attorneys teach you about putting the fences around your, your, exactly. your, your, yeah. your patent. So uh, I just continue to educate myself and I had attorneys and people like yourself help me uh, uh, build that up. You know what I like about your story is that it started with curiosity. Yep. You're curious. Yep. And I have a three-year-old and uh, she watches Sesame Street and they have a segment where they talk about, I wonder what if let's try. Yeah. And that's exactly uh, what you did. Yeah. It's really, really awesome. So you, you talked about your lawyers instructing you, hey, build a fence around yep. your idea. And it, that must have been a really... How, how was that learning curve for you, learning about the importance of IP to the business side of, of this? Yeah, they began to explain to me why I needed to protect it because they explained to you to me that once products are on the market, people might see it, they might come up with ideas, just like I came up with the idea, saying safety's first, and you wanted, and I wanted to protect it. And and then, you know. I had to dive in and understand what are you non-provisional, provisional, mm -hmm. and utility and design patents. And, and, and then the thing that was, you know, a little more interesting about the whole thing, uh, Richard, I didn't know that a patent, if you got it in the US, that you had to apply in Brazil right. and Europe and China and Australia, you had to go out and get international patents because we were going to try to sell products to our clients that were all over the world. So I was educated on all those things. And even the name Crash Cloud became a trademark. Mm. Uh, so they kind of helped me through the process. Like you said, it started from my curiosity. Yeah, it, we do have a, a question that has yep. come in. And, and before I, I get to that, um, I was able to explore your website and, and you guys' offerings. You guys do much more than just like football. Yes. And sports padding. Yeah. How did you think to expand it to all, all the other things that, 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 you, that you guys offer? And you can tell us, you know, what other paddings you, you offer in other industries. Yeah, yeah well, we, we started off and we realized that, you know, as we started to investigate and we're thinking about a business model and building a, a, a business around a patent and a technology, we said, well, we're solving for impacts like in sports, uh, but we quickly realized that there's other needs and areas of impact protection that people don't even think about from uh, military, automotive vehicles. Uh, we started looking at padding systems and foam systems and a lot of different applications. And all the time we, you know, there's a challenge, you know, we all affect millions of people are affected every day by impacts, right? Like people don't realize it, but you know, you're shipping packages, right? You right. know, they can break and be affected by impacts, uh, car accidents, uh, you, you know. You should call the guy who sells books online. Yeah. Thinking, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that right. And, you know, and how much and we started to look at it and we wanted to take on a business model like Vortex and Intel. We don't make the, the product, say the computer, we make the chip inside. So we make the padding solution inside. Like this is a great example. I bought this, so I had to go get this one. This is an Evo Shield helmet baseball helmet that has our technology on the inside right here mm. that's for baseball catchers and um that was one brand company we started to work with and then we started to work with all automotive companies and we just continue to expand um from there richard and you know today we like to say we're the experts in materials all right awesome look let's get our first question in from isabel what are the cons about getting something patented uh, I'll take a crack at that. And Sean, you can give your thoughts as well. Uh, well, one con is it's not a trade secret in that with a patent, and some people don't view this as a con, but if you ha had to find one, it could be that, well, you have to share, you have to share your invention with everybody else in the world. You have to mm -hmm. publish it. It's no longer a secret, okay? Because that's the exchange for this 20 year of exclusivity you have to tell us, basically, be able to teach someone how to make your invention. Um, so that's one thing that some people could consider uh, a con. 
Um, Sean, do you, do you have any thoughts? And, and that? to that point, Richard, and once they see it, just like I was able to see Darrell's, if it's not protected properly, uh, people can work around you and just change things. And then you might want to touch on like how easy it, you, you got to, when we talk about building that fence and just trying right. to make sure, you know, right. you cover yourself in the patent, right? When you, Yeah. And, and I guess that's another, one other con is that fence isn't forever. Right. Okay. Um, you know, copyrights can last 75 years plus, well, the life of the author plus 75 years, that can be a pretty long time. Um, but even that ends. Trademarks can last forever as long as that thing is being brought, bought and sold. Trade, trade secrets can last forever as long as it's, as long as it's kept a secret. So those are other uh, cons. We got some other questions coming in from Marcus. Do you think athletes are becoming more cognizant of the presence and importance of intellectual property? I, I think athletes should be becoming more uh cognitive of just business in general. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're starting to see guys more involved in companies and investments and and as they're thinking about opportunities to invest in or associate themselves with, they 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 learn, they get smarter and they educate themselves to, you know, you know, first thing you're gonna ask if somebody's producing a product, do you have a patent? Mm -hmm. A patent makes you more valuable in a lot of cases <laughs> when you're invested into a company. Investors like to see that you're protected. So I think, you know, athletes are getting smarter around just, you know, right opportunities. Okay. Right. And, and another example I would say is uh, it, along with that is uh, I think LeBron is a good example in understanding yeah. branding. Even though it's not a patent, we have yeah. a certain brand that gets into copyrights and trademarks. Right. Um, he's a producer of shows, which yep. is content and literary work that's copyrighted material that he owns and produces and, and puts out there um, mm -hmm. uh, for broadcast or streaming. So I, I would say yes. And, and Richard, I'll probably I have a question for you. Can I, I, can I name a LeBron James be trademarked or his likeness trade? Could you talk about likeness? Couldn't your likeness be trademarked or Something well, like we're, we, when you talk about something like a, like a silhouette, like the jump man. Yes, the jump man, right. You know, uh, is, is, is trademark uh, originally okay. by Nike. And I, I'm not quite sure if Michael was able to obtain that his, his, uh, his himself or, or not. Um, but LeBron is in people know. And, and when I say brand, I guess I, I should have, um, since I wasn't talking to attorneys, I used it colloquially. You know, <laughs> it's not LeBron trademark, but when people think of uh, LeBron, they know that he has business interests as well, whether yeah. it's owning a stake in, in Liverpool Football Club or also producing uh, shows like The Last Survivor and things like that. Um, but yeah. Um, another question, how long does it take to patent an idea? Now, idea is a term of art for patent attorneys and uh, an idea is something that is not quite to the level of patenting but we're just going to say we're going to we're going to interpret this question is how long does it take to get a patent mm -hmm. and it can take uh at least 18 months and some change mm -hmm. or it can take many years mm -hmm. uh, to get a patent in some of the more intricate arts like biotechnology uh, when you think about drugs that can take five plus years uh to get a patent just the back and forth of the process, what I talked about earlier in patent prosecution, of you talking with the patent and trademark office, arguing why your invention is novel and deserves to be patented. Sean, were, were you involved much in the patent prosecution process? Yes, because we, 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 we had to understand and be able to articulate the claims and different things. So uh, our first patent, as I, as I mentioned, we, you know, they would go back and forth and actually with it, with the attorneys would go back and forth with you and says, so does it do this? How, and they would work with you to help you come up with the claims for your patent. And, and, and to answer your question on how long does it take, uh, we had one patent that we received within like 18 months and we just received a Chinese patent and that's probably five, four years or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they can range. Um, I mean, like Richard said, yeah. they can range yeah. different time in it. And you have, sometimes you got to keep going back and forth through these different company countries. And, and Sean mentioned 18 months and I, and I said at least 18 months as well. 18 months comes from a part of the patent act where, 
uh, when you file a, a patent application, that patent application is confidential for 18 months. And then at that point, it's published. Uh, that patent application is published. So people can, the public can search it. Okay, mm -hmm. so it should take at least 18 months uh, for that to publish. And then the patent prosecution uh, kicks in. Uh, another question, what happens if you try to patent an idea? How do you know if someone else didn't already mm -hmm. come up with the same idea? Um, Sean, I don't know how much you were involved with, with that. What's been your experience with that? And then I'll also take a step. Well, back. my experience was because that was that's a, probably a fear because as we know, Richard, you know, it's hard to invent something new because most of the things in the world probably have already been created, maybe used in a different field. Um, but our attorneys uh, ran a patent search <laughs> and they helped us out. And I started off myself before the attorneys did, I started off, uh, just Googling, you know, yeah. airbag performance and then just kind of like, you know, that now you can go to Google patents and different things like that. But more professionally, I just allow the, the, the attorneys to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. I, I mentioned earlier that after 18 months, the, the patent application is published. So members of the public uh, or if you want to pay someone, the attorneys or whoever, they could do those searches, keyword searches and whatnot. Uh, to see what else is out there of, of what's filed as a patent application, what's already issued as a patent in this country or in any of the other countries that are out there that have um, patent applications, uh, patent systems. How long does a trademark last? Uh, I, I can uh, answer that, Sean, if you, don't, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. A trademark can last forever. One of the requirements for a trademark is that it has to be used in uh, interstate commerce. So as long as it is being used by that company and they have some evidence of it being used, it can last forever. Next up from Mr. Marcus, is it difficult to get protection in China? If so, what are some of the barriers? Uh, you mentioned that you guys got a patent in yeah. China. Would you say it was- It was very difficult. It, yeah. it, was, it was very difficult. And we had to, um, and, and, and we, we've had times where, you know, we talk about China and India, we, we had our, you know, attorney say it's not worth trying to get it in India. But in China, um, our attorneys went back and forth and just making iterations and you just, you had to kind of work it and mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, all the claims are right. And eventually if you stay at it, you can get it. Yeah. Um, you can't, is it difficult to get patent protection in, in China? Uh, it can be, it can be difficult in any of the other jurisdictions as well. The European Union has uh, a patent system, a, a process. Uh, you mentioned India, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, Korea, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, many of South, uh, South Africa, a whole lot of other countries have patent systems with varying degrees of difficulty uh, quite frankly. And sometimes it, it will just depend on what it is you are getting patented. So yes, it can be difficult. What is the average cost of prosecution of a utility patent? Beginning to end, including attorney and PTO fees. I, I'm going to take a stab at that. Yeah, uh, you, you uh, have that one. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, uh, and Christina, this, this can be a, a hard question to uh, to answer in that it depends. Uh, our system is set up that you as a member of the public, uh, uh, as a lay person, I'm assuming uh, that you're a lay person, you could do this yourself as a micro entity, as, as a sole applicant going back and forth with the Patent and Trademark Office, uh, which has the very minimal uh, filing fees for micro entities. Uh, of course, for patents for big corporations uh, that have want to protect the crown jewels, like for instance, the iPhone, uh, Apple, they're going to hire the most expensive lawyers they can get. And they're going to make sure, you know, everything, all the bells and whistles uh, are done. And uh, it could be very, very, very expensive uh, with the attorney fees and, and the PTO fees. But if you want to know more particularly about what the PTO fees are for the large entity, small entity, micro entity, you can go to uspto.gov, uspto.gov, 
And that information is available uh, there. What happens if you patent your item in the US only? Can someone else apply for a patent in another country with the same thing or does your patent protect you all over the world? Um, I can answer that, but I, I do wanna ask you, Sean, have, have you guys run into people trying to practice your invention? Um, we haven't had anyone try to practice our invention. We did have to defend um, the Crash Cloud name trademark. Mm -hmm. So we, we did run into that and, and the Winpack uh, name as well. So we had to defend those. Um, we haven't run across anyone trying to use, you know, our technology in different countries, not, not as of yet. Right. So uh, to the question, it is possible someone may try and file in another country on your idea, uh, how the systems should work, uh, no matter what IP uh, patent system you are, are, are filing in, they should be doing a search uh, of other uh, published material to see if that invention is out there. They also have rules or requirements that are similar to ours in that the invention should be novel and distinctive and uh, unobvious. Uh, they have similar requirements. They may phrase it differently, but they pretty much all have that requirement and they should be searching uh, databases outside of their country, which would include your published patent and hopefully all goes well, prevent that from happening. But of course, if you were, were, were to find this, then you would have to talk with an attorney to see what, what exactly you could do uh, about it. Oh. And, okay, two more here. Uh, and this is for you, Sean, definitely. What advice do you have for other inventors wanting to start a business? I would say, you know, the, the biggest challenge to starting a business is not believing that you can do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would tell people all the time, you know, don't get discouraged if you have an idea. Like you said, oh, man, I thought of this. But no, go for it. Investigate it. Do some work up front. And, you know, oftentimes it's, it's a fear that if you put yourself out there that you may fail. You know, yeah, that is a possibility, but there is a possibility without trying, you would never know what you can accomplish. So it, you got to put yourself out there and you got to, and, and, and another critical thing that we talked about is you got to, you know, find people who are in the space that you're trying to go to. And, you know, oftentimes if you ask people for help, they will give you help. Why the name Winpact? That was another question. Uh, it came up with our branding company, came up with that because the Crash Cloud, which is our first solution, uh, is air and it, it's, it's a unique combination of air and foam. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, when you hit it, or when you squeeze it like this on soft and medium impacts, okay. uh, it is soft. And then if you punch it, it tighten up. And hmm. therefore we call it the wind pact is because of the wind and impact, and then the crash cloud is the, is is the actual little solution that we call the crash cloud. All right, awesome. Were there impediments you faced in starting your business? How did you overcome them? That, oh amazing. yes, there was always a lot of challenges, and and still today we face challenges. You know, you know, as an entrepreneur and, and, and a tech founder, you have to raise money sometimes. Uh, so you, you're always constantly doing that. Other impediments were just finding the right people to help you bring mm -hmm. this idea to life. You got, you know, as a professional athlete and a guy who's played sports all my life, the one thing I can tell you about winning is you got to have a good team. Mm -hmm. And if you put the right people and find people who believe in you and who want to help support your vision, you know, that's what you have to do. So you have to have the right team and that, and that can be a challenge sometimes. And, and, um, and that was a, those are the two biggest things as you're growing and you're learning, there's always learning, you know, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily look at them as, as impediments or setback. I just look at it as opportunities to learn and get better. All right. Awesome. This has been great. I, I just kind of want to recap some of the things I've learned from you. One is 
the importance of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what if, let's try, you know, just be curious about something, ask questions, uh, the importance of mentorship, yep. you know, finding someone who's interesting and doing something that you're interested in, just be curious, ask them questions. How do you do this? You know, yeah. what's up with that? Um, and lastly, having a good team, having a good team around you that supports your vision, who wants to come with you on that journey, man. I really appreciate you. Yeah. This is a conversation. All, all good stuff. And, uh, and uh, Richard, thank you. And uh, uh, the great presentation I was able to learn. And <laughs> I took notes. I hope you guys took notes off the presentation because it starts with just uh, a, a twinkle in your eye, right? So, right. Uh, you know, sparking an idea. And, and it was a lot of good stuff. And thank you guys. Thank you, Christian, for having me. Absolutely. Thank you both so much, Richard and Sean. This has been very enlightening. Even for me, you have great energy, which makes this very interesting to listen to. So thank you so much. And thank you to our attendees and the questions that you posed um, to these two. And we really hope to see you on future webinars. Again, if you'd like any information about the future webinars that we're hosting, please email foundation at ipo.org. And we hope to see you soon. Stay safe and have a great night. Thank you both so much. Stay warm, everybody. <laughs>